morning. Welcome to the worship service this morning on Mother's Day, May 10th, 2020. We're glad that you're with us today, and it's a joy to have you joining us by live stream. And I do want to make a comment or two about uh, live stream so that you just understand what's happening and what God seems to be doing, uh, not only through the people of faith, but also um, in a larger reach in our nation and beyond. Uh, as of last Sunday, I'm very, very delighted and I think surprised to report that we have individuals who are watching our live stream from 24 different states. And that's just remarkable to me. And I'm, I'm thankful for that, grateful for that. Uh, I think as well shocked uh, that that's happening. But glad that we have individuals who are, we trust, benefiting from the worship services that we are live streaming during this time in our nation's history as well as what's happening all around the world. So welcome. We're, we're glad that you're able to join us and we trust that today's worship service will also be a blessing to you. The Holy Spirit can use it for your edification and for your encouragement and for uh, uplifting you and, and directing you in the most holy faith. So welcome if you're joining us by live streaming. I thank this congregation and others who have also been contributing so generously 
And so faithfully, paying your tithes, giving your gifts, and God is certainly helping us. Uh, we are just a little bit behind our uh, normal budget and where we need to be, and our church year concludes at the end of June. So especially if that uh, check that maybe you have received already from the government is just burning a hole in your pocket and you want some counsel as to where that might be directed, give me a call. I have some suggestions, and I'd be glad to encourage you regarding uh, a potential gift but in all seriousness, we thank you for your giving, and we thank you that there is such an expression, such a consistent demonstration of the faithfulness of this people, this congregation, and we are grateful for your giving and for your faithfulness in that area. Also, just appreciate those who have, on a consistent basis, we've just come to, to depend upon them have helped us with live streaming. I know I mentioned their names, but I'm going to continue to do so because we are grateful for their help. We are so thankful for Pastor Mike and all, all that he has done to make sure that in these broadcasts we have music that uh, is from the times when we were able to be together, whether it's the choir, whether it's the men's group, or congregational singing. We're just thankful for all that's been done to provide a full uh, expression of worship. And so we thank Pastor Mike for his hard work. We also appreciate so much Andrew and Alethea Stratton helping us in all the technical work of making these live streaming programs possible. So they've just been troopers. We're grateful for them. So glad that we've been able to count uh, on them, and they have come through for us wonderfully. And from time to time, Pastor uh, Jared Massey has been helping us in the sound booth as well, and we just give praise for the people of God, those who give of their abilities and their talents to help us as we do our best to minister in these very challenging days. I do want to mention that I've received several text messages and emails regarding reopening, and I think many of you are as tired of being in your homes as perhaps the rest of us are, and so I'm receiving your, your recommendations, and I appreciate your, uh, your thoughts about reopening. We are giving that consideration every week, frankly, on a daily basis, and if we are able to reopen sooner than we have been sharing with you, we will do so. And we're looking at that opportunity and that option, and we'll let you know if indeed we're able to open early, and we'll get the word to you. I do want to say today that uh, on behalf of the moms in our congregation and those that we love so dearly and appreciate so much, happy Mother's Day. And uh, I, I'm just grateful for the exemplary moms <clears throat> that we have in our congregation. We just have a wonderful, wonderful expression of motherhood in our congregation, both uh, seasoned moms and new moms. We are just delighted for uh, the way that God has blessed you and also the way that you are rearing your children, bringing them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So happy Mother's Day. And I do want to mention to you again that as has become... Our uh, custom, and as we, we care about life, we know that life is sacred, life is a gift from God, that in your honor, moms, we will give another gift this year uh, to PDHC, Pregnancy Decision, Decision Health Centers, uh, in your honor. Uh, we, we believe that that's one of the best things that we could ever do to show our appreciation for our mothers by giving a gift that impacts life and life that needs to be protected in the womb. So just note that, that we will be doing that again this year in your honor uh, as we appreciate so much uh, who you are and what you do. I think that's all I need to mention at this time. So would you join me as we pray and as we invite the Lord's presence among us and in our midst. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you this day recognizing that this has been a week for, for all of us that has its unique factors. There have been blessings. There have been moments of great encouragement. There have also been moments that are hard, that are more difficult than we ever imagined. And all in between, everything that has been encountered this, encountered this week by our people, 
runs the full spectrum. But we're thankful as we come together today to worship you. You are the constant one. You are the God who changes not. And you are the one upon whom we can wholeheartedly depend. You fail not. Your goodness is constant. And your faithfulness, your loving kindness extends to every successive generation. So we praise your name today. We declare our dependence upon you as well, and we ask that you would bless our moments of worship. May the music that has been placed in in the order today be a blessing and an encouragement to all, and may the Word come to us with anointing and by the help of your Spirit to minister to each of our hearts. We ask especially bless our moms and bless their efforts as they seek to bring up their children, and as they seek to direct them to love you. We pray that you would give them encouragement. We ask, Lord, that they would understand how critical their role is, not only in their individual homes, but in society as well. Give them great blessing this day. And may they know that their children rise up and call them blessed, and their husbands as well. Encourage and bless and fortify them, we pray, for your glory, for your honor, and for the good of each home, and for the good of our culture. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand together. Welcome to everyone. Stand together as we sing the praises of the Lord. Praise Him. Praise Him. what we have done. Okay, now we're going to take you back a little ways. 
Many of you remember this song and put a smile on your face as you sing it together. smiled. You had fun singing that song. Continue in our worship together. Sing it prayerfully now to the Lord.
As the ushers come forward, would you please bow your heads with me? Father God, we come before you today. We thank you for the mothers in our lives. We thank you for the grandmothers, the aunts, these lovely women that you have appointed in our lives. I'm thankful for my mother, and I'm also thankful for my church moms. I'm thankful, God, for everything that you do for us. Lord, just be here in this place as the men's chorus continue to sing. Be with us as Pastor Jonathan comes as well. And Lord, just just fill us with your love and your spirit this week. And just be with us. Let these tithes and offerings be a blessing for you, God. We love you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Before we look at the text today, let me just announce where we will be looking. I then want to share some comments, personal comments, before we move into the message for this morning. I want to talk a little bit about what Mother's Day means to me and the lives of those who are especially dear to me. But before we do that, uh, turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus 20, verses 1 through 21 is where we will be reading in just a moment. You can find that and be prepared for, uh, for us to look at that together and follow along where you are at home. But I, w- I do want to say, first of all, that I am a grateful son of Leona Grace Morgan. Her maiden name was Creek, Leona Grace Creek. She was born in 1922. In fact, she was born in the month of May, 1922. So if she were still living, she would be 98 this year. And I am the fifth child of uh, her family, and obviously, without question, uh, the best of the five. And so if my uh, siblings are watching, they can just know that that's been resolved And mom told me that, by the way, and she shared that with me frequently. And so I just now want to inform you that that's what she said. Uh, No, uh, that's not the case. But the the reality is I had a a wonderful birthplace in um, and birth order, being the last of five children. And I'm certainly thankful that I had such a marvelous mom as I had. She... uh, instructed me in so many ways that I don't have time to share all of that today, but especially through her life and in the way that she lived and the way she expressed her faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and the constancy, the, the wonderful manner in which she went about life's issues, and those issues might have been at times turbulent and difficult as well as jubilant, but in all of those she was a steady presence of one who loved God and depended upon Him, taught her children well, sang the hymns of faith to us, and taught us in many respects theology in those wonderful hymns that she would sing around the home. And I grew up in a wonderful, very, very secure, happy home. And I'm just grateful for that. Great father, thankful for my dad, and all five of us in our family take so much personality-wise after our dad. Our, our poor mom tried her best and did her best to influence us, but we are just marked by uh, the, the personality traits of my dad. Um, but I'm so thankful for my mom, a wonderful, wonderful woman, significant role uh, in my life. I married a woman very much like her. I, I, very, I, I married a woman, and I think by just the natural leanings of having a good mom, I didn't even know it, but I, I found that I pursued a woman that was just personality-wise very much like my mother. Sharma is quiet and reserved, but she is also a person of great and deep conviction, and she is a person of great integrity as well as one who is just firm and resolute in following after God. So I've had two marvelous women in my life who have profoundly influenced me. My mother and then my wife, Sharma. I don't perhaps give her enough credit that she is due. And if any of you you know, know me very well, you're all thankful that I have the wife that I have. Um, If anybody gives me uh, balance and stability, it is Sharma. But I've also watched her as a mother and now a grandmother. And over the years that I watched her as a mother, she was a wonderful mother to our two sons. And I know that they sense this as well, that uh, they were privileged as children growing up in a home with such a wonderful and faithful, loving mother. And she's loving still. She loves her sons. She loves her sons. There's no question about that. In addition, she's a wonderful grandmother. And I've been able to watch that. I've been privileged to witness that. And just from time to time, as she is interacting with her grandchildren, 
uh, I, I get the wonderful perspective and the vantage point of just seeing her beam and radiate uh, joy and express love uh, that she has for her grandchildren. So I just today want to thank God publicly and give God praise for a wonderful mother that God gave to me, and I am grateful to, to be her son, thankful to be her son, and I want to thank God for ever giving me such a wonderful wife in Sharma and the wonderful mother she has been, the character that she has passed on to her two sons and how she is as a grandmother. So having said that, I just want you to know today I'm grateful for outstanding women. And I know that we have a congregation full of them. And I, I am just thankful for women who love God, who are great support to their husbands, and are model mothers. We honor you today, and we praise you today. In fact, your role, along with the role of fathers, is absolutely essential, critical to the well-being of our culture and our world. And I, I, I don't ever want the role of motherhood to be demeaned in a culture that stresses other accomplishments. There isn't any greater accomplishment in life than being a good mother and rearing your children toward God and helping your children think about who God is and teaching them who Jesus is and bringing them to a point in their lives where they have been led to a desire and led to a presence of God in order to love Him. So I want you to know that we value who you are and the role that you play. In Exodus chapter 20, we look at the Ten Commandments, and we're going to read all ten, and we're going to look at the context of the offering of these Ten Commandments. And I want us to note these under the title, God's Infrastructure. God's infrastructure, and I'll look at that with you in uh, more detail in the moments that follow. But let's look together at Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 21, and let's look at what God has to say to us about Himself, how we relate to Him, and then those key factors about how we relate to one another, human to human, person to person. Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain." Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant, or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. All the people perceived the thunder and lightning flashes and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood at a distance. Then they said to Moses, "'Speak to us yourself, and we will listen.'" 
but let not God speak to us, or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid, for God has come in order to test you. Isn't that good to know? And in order that the fear of Him may remain with you, so that you may not sin. So the people stood at a distance while Moses approached the thick cloud where God was. The Ten Commandments, the Ten Words, the Ten Titles of Great Principles, the Truth Language that is critical to God is what we have just read. But there's an important factor that I want us to highlight today. I want us to spend our time today not looking at all ten of them, but looking at one in particular. You've probably guessed it. It's the fifth commandment, and it's the, cam- it's the commandment that has a unique role to play in God's rolling out of these marvelous truth principles, these categories of principle and these tenets of truth that are to be expressed in our lives, in our worship, in our devotion, these principal categories are uh, never-ending in the sense that they do not run their course, they do not conclude, there isn't a time in which they become obsolete, there isn't a moment in our lives when these no longer matter. God gave them, they're timeless, and they are critical, but there is a unique role of one of them in particular, and it is indeed the fifth commandment. And the fifth commandment we look at in many respects as a bridge. It's a bridge between two main points of purpose or intent or focus. These two sides really of the coin of what we are called to be and called to do and how we are called to live. The first four of the Ten Commandments deal in proper succession with how we relate to God. It is without question, these, these are given to us as Godward intentions. These are Godward in our focus and in our purpose. How we relate to God, what God expects of us. Not only the quality and kind of devotion, but that which we must avoid that was so common in paganism, we are never ever to express in polluted or in perverted ways toward Yahweh, toward the God, the one who is God. Yahweh, He is God. We are never ever to express like the, like the heathen do, like the pagans do, worship like they do toward the one true and living God. We are to approach Him in a way that brings honor and glory to His name. We are to meet His conditions. We are to pay attention to His Word. We are to pay attention to how we are called to worship the God of the Scriptures and how He expects us to relate to Him. The first four are profound in the life of devotion lived for God. But we know that living for God, living with God, obeying God, honoring Him in our devotion and in our worship doesn't leave life lived in, in skin and life lived with others, doesn't leave that part of existence out. Our life that is Godward, our intentions and purposes that are directed toward God absolutely impact the lives we live with one another. And so the bridge between those two is the fifth commandment, which deals not just with children honoring their parents. That certainly is there. It's clear as can be that that's included in that great commandment, but also included in that commandment is the raising of the bar or the importance of the home, the importance of the family. And I want to spend some time on that today so that we can appreciate what God is saying to us as God is speaking in that Sinai moment to the children of Israel, those who are afraid of Him and afraid even to hear His voice and had asked that perhaps Moses would be the one who would speak because they thought if God speaks, we'll die. And Moses told them, don't be afraid. 
have reverence, be in awe of God, treat Him with reverential respect, but don't fear Him in the sense of torment that He is ready and purposed and intentioned to destroy you. Don't be afraid of Him. Don't let it torment you. Listen to what He has to say. Don't run from hearing from the voice of God. They needed to hear what God had to say. So this bridge between how we serve God and the role that we, we demonstrate between us and God, God and us, and how that plays out and has impact among all of the rest of life's relationships is bridged by this one great command. Children, children, honor your father and mother that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. In this text, as well as in all of the commandments, I want us to note some factors that cannot be avoided. I want us to know that there are just codes of responsibility all the way laced and included, just beautifully included in these Ten Commandments that we must never, ever avoid. We must never run from them. We must never shirk them. There's a word, really, that we could insert here that is important. It's important for where we are in life today. It's important in every generation. But it is, in many respects, it has been removed from our discourse. It's been removed from our conversations. It's been, it's been removed from our vernacular. It really has been pressed out, especially by the self-absorption days, the selfie culture in which we live, those who believe that life should simply be what I want it to be, I make it to be, I call it to be, I choose it to be, and I should never in any other way have to respond to anything or anyone else, authority figures are out of my life. The only factor for living is me, me, me. Well, in light of that, in light of that sinful tendency in the human condition, God has some things to say. God indeed speaks. And the Sinai moment, if anything, deals a death blow to any kind of sprouting notion that we should live life exclusively for ourselves. The Ten Commandments are, first of all, Godward and then other conscious, and they depend upon one critical factor, one important component in order for the commandments of God not only to be appreciated, but ultimately to be heeded, and it is the word obey or the word obedience. If we were to look at the fifth commandment, there are just layers of obedience, and I've already cited two of the wonderful women who have modeled motherhood in my life. And I, want, I just want to note this, not only on a personal level, but also from the precepts of God. There are some givens in this bridge commandment that we need to note. There's an infrastructure moment that we need to take note of in, in the commandment that we have just read, in the fifth commandment. This is an infrastructure matter to all of culture, all of society, and ultimately, if anybody is ever going to be inclined to come to God, this is one of those moments that we need to heed and we need to obey. You know, right now, there's a lot of talk in Washington, D.C. about the deplorable condition of our physical infrastructure in our nation. And usually when that is mentioned, there are several factors, there are several layers of that infrastructure that are mentioned. Whether it's our electrical grid, whether or not it's our vulnerability in those regards, whether it is kind of that dilapidated system, if it's maybe a, a, a situation where we've got to make sure that uh, every part of America, especially rural areas, have uh, you know, fast 
uh, high-speed internet connections. We talk about infrastructure. We talk about the condition of our roads. And all you have to do is drive around town. There are some places I could direct you and you could find uh, in short order, especially with the suspension beaten to death of your car, that the roads are in sad shape pretty much wherever you go in our nation. That's a part of our infrastructure. Another focus of our infrastructure needs is our bridges. How much do we hear about and do we have talked about how we are dealing with crumbling bridges in our nation and how important bridges are for commerce, for our interconnectedness, for the ability to move freely throughout the nation, for trucks to be able to deliver goods, all of those kinds of things are mentioned over and over again that we have to restore, we have to repair our infrastructure. I want to say to you today that if we talk about infrastructure, let's talk for a moment about God's infrastructure. This critical bridge that is a part of the Ten Commandments, this fifth commandment, a part of God's infrastructure, is in tremendous need of repair. This bridge that makes all of life, both in its worship, in its response to God, in its obedience to God, as well as the interactions person to person, human to human, our existence depends on repairing the bridges. And if there's ever a bridge in our infrastructure, morally and spiritually, that needs to be prepared, needs to be repaired, it is the bridge of the home. It is the bridge of the family. It cannot be underestimated. It cannot be disregarded. The fabric, the fabric of our culture and our society is absolutely dependent upon, relying upon, formed by, shaped by the condition of homes, the condition of families. So what are some layers then that are givens in this fifth commandment? One of the layers is the recognition of the fact that a man and a woman have paid honor and respect and have responded obediently to the call of God on their lives. A man and a woman have honored God. They've lived for God. They have given their hearts to God. They love God. Their primary affection is God. They are devoted to God. Then they come together as husband and wife. That's another layer. That's another strata in God's wonderful infrastructural plan. This is what God is doing. They come together, and as they come together, their marriage is formed on one solid foundation. It is a Godward, God-formed, God-shaped, Word-ordered relationship. It is a relationship that is sanctioned by the grace and the goodness of the God they love and the God they serve. They leave their homes and they come together and become one, but it is a God-blessed union. It is a God-favored union. He orders it. He ordains it. For a godly man and a godly woman to come together and form a godly marriage and become husband and wife. And then another layer emerges. I know that there are exceptions, but God's plan also includes that we should have the opportunity and the privilege, some perhaps by different means, but the fact is we are given such a, a love for one another that that there is evidence that comes from that, blessing that comes from that, life that comes from that, gifts that are given to that. And it becomes an arena where other life can be produced. God is pleased with that. That becomes the fruit of their faithfulness to God, and they have children. And as that layer then develops, they understand their responsibility to bring up their children in the nurture and admonition 
of the Lord. They start out Godward singly. They come together and form one flesh that is Godward and God formed and is on the foundation that God has established for us. Out of that comes the wonderful fruit of children. What a gift from God. What a marvelous, marvelous gift from God. We have a couple of families that have taken that gift seriously. And as the psalmist said, blessed is the man who has his, has his quiver full of them. The children are an, heritage, they're an inheritance of the Lord. They're a heritage of the Lord. And blessed is the man who has his quiver full of them. Some of you have taken that seriously. And the Lord is blessing you with children. Along with the blessing, along with the gift of life, though, comes in increasing responsibility. And in your responsibility, you realize that your primary purpose is not to make your children dependent upon you. In fact, all of your work is like that of a surrogate. You stand in the gap for someone. You are to your children the speaker, the, the leader, the modeler, the mentor, the one who stands in the gap in your children's lives so that their lives are saturated by a variety of means by which they are taught, they are trained, their hearts and minds are sculpted and directed all for one supreme being, for God Himself. You are the stand-ins in their life to bridge another gap, to bridge another gulf, and to provide a connection that is essential. And that responsibility of parenthood is critical on this level. We are called to bring our children as far as we can bring free moral agents along. We are to bring them as far as we possibly can to make connection with the living God, to love God, to live for Him, to give themselves to Him exclusively, to honor Him in devotion that is absolutely unfailing, unflinching, and absolutely devoted. You as a parent are responsible with that primary task to bring them that far along so that their first inclination will be to seek the face of God. Layer upon layer, there is responsibility and obedience, responsibility and obedience, responsibility and obedience. And then out of all of those steps of honoring God, there is the reward, the payoff of children who are brought up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord who have a first impulse and inclination as their parents have taught them and modeled before them. They have the first thought that I am indeed a person under the gaze, under the guidance, under the grace of a God who loves me, and I need to respond to Him. I need to reckon with Him. I need to deal with Him. I need to understand who He is and where I am in His great plan. I need to yield to Him, to submit to Him, give my life to Him. I have been saturated in a home of prayer and in a setting where sound truth and theology has been sung and where the Word of God has been read and cherished, but most importantly, lived. And as a result, I have everything in my favor to move me to the choice and, and to the decision that the God of my parents will become my God too. That is all that God is doing in the layers of responsibility and the layers of obedience that we are called to live in this great bridge commandment. So much so that the outcome, the return on investment, the result would be that the children honor their father and their mother. Now this word honor is an interesting word. Let me give you just a few thoughts to consider about this word honor. Nothing wrong with having a home where there's laughter and where there's teasing and where there's back and forth, etc. But let's keep something in mind that I believe this word demonstrates and this word defines. Parents are always called to be parents. Your 
objective, your purpose, your primary task needs to be understood deeply in your heart and in your mind. You did not have children for the sake of making them dependent upon you. You did not have children so that you can have pals that you can run around with. You did not have children so that you can treat them, especially before really they become adults. Even when they are adults, they are somewhat your peers, but they are still your children, and you are their parents. There's an unending role for you to play. I'm not saying that you shouldn't enjoy being with them, enjoy spending time with them, enjoy shopping with them, those things, but that's not the primary purpose. The primary purpose is not somehow to fill your life by making and creating nothing but dependence upon you. This is not a way of, of making your life somehow more balanced, filling voids in your life, because they run around dependent upon you. No, in fact, some of the hardest things to get through our hearts and minds as parents is we're raising them, training them, we are nurturing them not to be dependent upon us, but to be dependent upon God. And we short-circuit our bridge responsibility. We, we put cracks in the bridge we affect its, its power and we affect its role when we just create and glom onto them and demand from them that they be dependent upon us. In fact, we ultimately want them to surpass us. And we want them to live gladly, joyfully, and devotedly dependent upon God and not on us. I'll demonstrate it this way. Toward the end of my father's life, having been a, a marvelous preacher and pastor and man of God, he had several conversations with my brother and with me, both of us obviously at that time, well engaged in the work of ministry. And toward the end of his life, he said to us frequently in conversations when we were together or when we were just with him one-on-one. -on -one. And he said over and over and over again, I pray for you in what God has called you to do, and I have hopes and aspirations and expectations in your lives. And he would say this over and over again, I expect you to be far more effective in serving God because you are standing on my shoulders. And everything that he, he would say, everything that your mother and I have done for you is to catapult you, is to move you with greater fervor and intensity and wherewithal to serve the God that we too have served. And I wondered about that at the time, but I thank God for that now, that my dad wasn't trying to bring honor and glory to himself, nor was my mother. They didn't train us and rear us and sacrifice for us, pray for us, love us, live the truth before us so that we would somehow be dependent upon them, and bring glory and honor to them. They wanted us to bring glory and honor to God. May God help us to understand that and to appreciate that. This word, honor, has with it, in especially the mind and the heart of a child, that we will not squander what has been honorably, faithfully lived in front of us. Whether it is in word, in instruction, but especially in life, or in the modeling, in the living of that truth, we are called to let that instruction and let that 
leading and that nurturing be for us a matter of weightiness that we hold dear and precious and that we obey, we honor, we honor. So it's not that we just, we throw a big party for our parents. That's not what is meant here. It, it, it isn't that we look at our parents and we just praise them and lavish praise upon them, although that's not a bad thing to do. Uh, it's tough being a parent. It's risky business being a parent. It's not for the faint of heart, and you ought to show some appreciation. Uh, if you're out there, uh, hear me. We ought to appreciate that. But that's not the intent here. The intent here is, children, consider weighty. Consider instruction of gravity. Consider everything that you have been taught and everything that has been lived before you by your parents as a weighty matter to consider so that you in your living, you in the trajectory of your life, that you in the God you follow, that you in the way that you honor your parents is that you live for the God they directed you to know and to love and to serve. Carry everything that they have given you and appreciate it and, and hold it in high regard and consider it weighty words of importance, of value, and gravity. That's the way we honor our parents. You know, there are thoughts that go through my mind from time to time. I have a birthday coming up in June, and, and it's, uh, you know, one of those that most of us run from. Um, but nonetheless, it's going to happen. And as that approaches, there are thoughts that go through my mind. First of all, the thought is, I want to make sure that I live in a way and that I do the work of ministry that I have been called to do, that I fulfill that in a way that brings honor and glory to God. He's the one that called me. It is not about me. I'm not, I'm not the focus. I am not the, the object of praise and accolade. That's not the interest and that's not the point. The point is I want to bring honor and glory to God. In everything that I do and in everything that I say, I want to bring honor and glory to God. But wedged in there in importance, I don't want to wait, waste the weighty instruction that my parents so faithfully gave me. In fact, in a right sense, Max and Leona Morgan are still figures in my life that I hope to please because they led me, they directed me, they modeled before me a life that they knew was the right life, the best life, a life lived for God. And I not only want to bring honor and glory to God, but I also want to be appreciative to model the weighty truth that Max and Leona Morgan gave me. This great commandment is also just laced with promise. Not only the promise of what is a given in it, parents, children, blessing, fruit, all of that, life, but the blessing that is also for the offspring, for the children. Honor your father and mother. Consider the weighty lessons and truths they've taught you. Take them in. Rake them into your life. Ask God to make them so in you. Appreciate them. Value all that they've taught you. Ask God to help you live in light of all of that. And the result is a wonderful promise of reward. Through the responsibility through all of the obedient factors that are a part of the commandments, through giving of ourselves in faithfulness and fidelity, not only to God but to one, to one another, there's a marvelous result. There's the fruitful life of long life, good life, lived in a way that is under the constant dispersion 
of the favor of God. What a bridge commandment. What a great and model truth. The rest of the commandments that have to do with how we interact with one another flow from this bridge. The connection with God is found in the fifth commandment. But the rest of the commandments that deal with our interchange and our interconnectedness with people flows from this great bridge commandment. So between faith and fidelity, there is fruit, long life, good life. So between responsibility, yes, there's risk, but there's reward. I'll close with this little little illustration and thank you for perhaps giving me a little bit more time than normal. I've shared bits and pieces before from my father's life that he grew up in a very, very turbulent home. Both of my grandparents on my father's side were on their second marriage when my father, his older brother Melvin, uh, came into that home. So both of them had been divorced and there were problems in that home. Uh, my grandfather, in many respects, I think had, had a gen, genuinely merry heart, but my grandmother was a, a, another case. And I won't go into the details of, of what my grandmother was like. But as a mother, I'm sure the friction, the strife, the contention, the fights that my dad and my uncle saw on a regular basis were enough to drive my uncle Melvin so away from the notion of marriage that he never married. He served in World War II along with my dad, but when he returned home, he separated ties with his parents, especially his mother, moved to California, and for the, for the most part, except for coming back to her funeral, he stayed away from them and never had the courage to take the risk to marry. My father told the story to us that he was so in love with our mother and he so wanted to marry her that it, it helped put him over the edge of the utter fear that it would end in the disaster of a home life that he had left of his upbringing. And in fact, he made the statement several times to us. He said, I, I had in the back of my mind, even though I was a Christian, even though I was minding God and God had given me this lovely woman to marry. He said, even up to the day of our wedding, he said, there was the nagging thought in the back of my mind, if this doesn't work out, I can always get out of it and divorce her. How sad, how sad to have that nagging, haunting thought of a life that he had seen lived so poorly, lived so dishonorably, and lived so much without God that the idea of marriage, even though he was deeply in love with my mom, was the greatest risk of his life. I just want to say this. I thank God. I thank God today that God helped my dad get over that hump. I'm thankful that he had the courage to take the risk because I'm a product of that. My other four siblings are a product of that, and I thank God that God gave my dad enough courage to take the risk of marrying my mom. It wasn't a tough one as far as my mom was concerned, but marriage in general was a huge step for my father. When my grandmother died and our Uncle Melvin came back from California to attend her funeral, I remember him saying to those of us who were present in the home at that time, I heard him saying to my mother, he called her Lee, he said, Lee, if I would have known that there could be a home life, a family like this, I would have married, I would have taken the risk. There's risk. There's always risk. But when there is faith marked by fidelity, there's wonderful fruit. 
I thank God for the fruit. I thank God for Sharma being my wife and being the mother of two sons. I thank God for fruit that has continued from the blessing of God. Honor, honor your father and mother, and your days will be long on the earth. Moms especially, may God bless you. You do not have an easy task, but it is one, if done well with the help and grace of God, that yields wonderful fruit. In just a moment, after we have heard a wonderful closing hymn, we're going to spend some time in prayer. We have some very real needs and some folks for whom we need to pray that are in a very keen and sharp time of need. And we'll close our service today by praying, especially for those that we will list by name. But at this time, let's appreciate and maybe even sing along with the, the closing number, Give Me a Passion. Sing these words. Give me a passion for you.
as we prepare to close the service this morning. It's a, it's a point of, of deep sorrow and shared grief that we mentioned today that um, Paul Alford, Paul and Vanjie have been a part of our congregation and we love and appreciate them. And Paul yesterday suffered a, a catastrophic heart attack, <clears throat> very young man and uh, was unable to be revived and unable to be served in a way that could mitigate the heart attack and left this world uh, and is present with the Lord. We thank God for His wonderful life and His testimony, but this is nonetheless a, a very sh real shock there were, there were really no points of evidence leading up to this and nothing in his condition that gave any kind of an indication of this. So we're praying for Vanji, and uh, their sons are making their way back to Lancaster from different points of where they live. And, of course, Vanji has two sisters and their families who attend uh, faith as well. So we're praying for Kim and her family, Lori and her family, as this is such a, a shock and a loss to this immediate as well as extended family. So I want you to pray for uh, the Paul Alford family and just remember them uh, in these days. These are difficult days even to have appropriate and fulfilling settings where we can express grief and we can have services. And with all of those uh, constraints, it makes even expressing grief difficult. So pray for the family and please remember them uh, in these days. We also have a prayer request of Whitley uh, Step, four-week-old little girl who was undergoing some surgery to repair, I believe, a hernia and suffered a stroke during the surgery. So that name has come to us that we might remember this little one and pray for her. Then we're also remembering David Nelson and just he's on our prayer list but we want to pray for David. He's had a very difficult past week and we want to remember David. He's a dear brother. He and Marianne are special people <clears throat> and we want to pray for David. We're also uh, praying for Jessica and uh, Rosalind uh, Pritchett in remembering those needs today. Be mindful as well, even though we know that our, our keeper and our helper is the Lord. He uses the people of God to be His hands and His feet and to be His prayer partners and His prayer warriors. And we need to pray for those who have been especially either physically or financially hit with what COVID-19 has done to life as we've known it. Those who have either lost jobs or have been furloughed or have received reductions in their pay, uh, it runs the gamut as far as those who are in need. And we need to pray for one another uh, in these days, especially not only of physical impact, but of economic impact. And we want to pray one for another. And we want to pray that God can do with all of this what only He can do and that these will not be wasted moments. We know that uh, for some, it's an opportunity politically not to waste a crisis. My prayer is that spiritually, this crisis will not be wasted on us and on our world and on our nation. So let's join together in prayer as we close the service Please be mindful at home of these acute needs that we have mentioned. Father, with joy and also with heavy, uh, heavy hearts, with joy in our hearts and with heaviness upon us, we come to you today. We pray, Father, especially for Vanji and her sons and for Kim and her family and Lori and her family and all the connected loved ones that have been bonded with a wonderful love 
for Paul. We pray for them that they will find in you grace that indeed fits every moment and every need. Your grace is marvelous in that way. And we pray for its full dispatch today to help shocked, numb, grieving hearts. So we ask, Lord, for your, just your overflow of grace and such a real, tangible sense of your presence that they will sense your uplift and your sustaining power. We pray, Lord, for little Whitley, and we, can, we just bring her to you and ask that you would touch her little body, and bring healing to her. We pray, Lord, for David, and ask that you would work in his life as you have been and is pleasing to you and in a way, Lord, that we know will bring glory to you, but also good for them. Be with them. Lord, there are many needs, and we pray for especially our folks that are in concern and deep need financially. We pray, Lord, that you would be their supply in a miraculous way and that they will be able to say, this doesn't compute on paper, but we have found our God to be a keeper of His promise. He's taken care of us. He's sustaining us. He's meeting our needs. We pray that you would just supply, supply, supply all of our needs, we pray. We ask also, Lord, for an awakening that might come as fruit from this time that has been so difficult in our world and in our nation. Help us also to trust you and have confidence in your goodness that you are our God and we do not shrink down in fear and in fear of torment, but we are trusting you for our lives and for our well-being. We pray for a soon-to-come opportunity to worship together in person. Be with our people. Bless us in our witness to others. Give us fruit for our labor. May there be an awakening of hearts and minds. May there also be a rekindling of our faith for those who have been a part of your church for years. Do a good work in all of this mess. Bring goodness Bring redemption out of the stress, we ask. Be with our people. Bless our moms today and help us as children to honor them. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Join us Wednesday at 7 o'clock and we'll be in touch. Keep the faith. Keep the faith.